For those of you who just joined us, once again, welcome to this event in partnership with uh, Copenhagen Business School. Of course, the focus of this event is going to be the, um, the Copenhagen MBA uh, with its um, track in sustainability. So we actually have two representatives on behalf of uh, CBS today. We have Andrew Meller, he's the full-time MBA admissions manager at CBS, welcome. Thanks, Lavinia. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm from the MBA programs admissions team. I'm really happy to join today. You guys can call me Andrew or Andy. Um, and yeah, we can um, go through a bit of basics about the program and, and how it connects to sustainability um, and, uh, and answer plenty of your questions today as well. Thank you so much, Andrew, for being here with us today. And we also have Ivan Sokolov. He's uh, the Senior Sustainability Manager at Ascendis Pharma and ACBS alumnus. Welcome, Ivan. Uh, thanks, Lavinia. Thanks, Andy. Welcome, guys. Happy to talk about my journey and a little bit about sustainability. Looking forward. Thank you so much, Ivan, for being here with us today. And of course, for uh, those of you who just joined, of course, the topic of the event is going to be the CBS MBA and its sustainability track. Ivan here will give us his live testimonial about his, his, uh, his own experience at uh, as a um, uh, CBS student and, of course, alumnus. So we will talk everything about career prospects in terms of what can you expect um, while you are studying uh, for the MBA and what you can expect afterwards. And, of course, I just wanted to mention that if you have any questions regarding the MBA uh, curricula, if you have any questions about the career prospects, um, of course, feel free to write in the Q&A box and we will be happy to take your questions after the presentation. I also wanted to mention that for those of you who wish to request it, we offer the uh, certificate of attendance on behalf of Doxity. So I will pop more information about that in the chat later. But in the meantime, once again, welcome and thank you for being here with us today. So without further ado, Andrew, the floor is yours. Great, thanks, Lavinia. That's a really helpful introduction, and and uh, we will be able to send out the recording afterwards and and uh, the slides too. Or the slides within the recording so uh, feel free to just listen and enjoy today guys and i think first thing i'll just apologize for my voice if i disappear it's because i have a cold at the moment um so just bear with me if, if i need a little uh, 10 seconds but otherwise it's really nice to to be able to, sh to talk to you guys today so i'll just share my screen because i have some uh, slides to uh, uh to show you guys and i'll just make them go full screen I just need to switch that around, I think. Yes, thank you. Perfect. Uh, and that looks good from your end? Yes, I confirm. Terrific. OK, well, I'll start with um, just welcoming you guys again. Um, my name's Andrew. I'm from the MBA programs ad admissions team. And we're going to cover a little bit about initially what um, Copenhagen Business School is and a bit more about the program, just to give you some practical insights how we connect to sustainability. And then the main event is uh, uh, Ivan uh, talking about himself and his story, and, uh, and then we'll open up for some questions, as we say. So a bit about Copenhagen Business School. We've been around a long time, over 100 years. Uh, we're actually around um, 20,000 students, one of the biggest business schools in um, in Europe. Um, but the, the full-time MBA is actually, uh, the MBA school, I should say, is relatively small. We have um, three MBA um, programs and today we'll be focusing on the uh, full-time MBA. Um, MBA isn't a protected term so how can you how can you judge whether uh, or weigh up whether an MBA is at a certain level or benchmark quality within a certain level of, of MBAs um, and one of the first things I just wanted to cover just very basically um, was around accreditation and rankings because like I say how, how are you able to tell uh, one MBA from the other and if you google MBA you'll probably get about a billion results so What's a good starting point maybe is for you if you're early in the process is is to look at accreditation and rankings. And actually, I noticed some from the participants list. I noticed some names I recognize. So apologies for guys who are already familiar with this. But basically, accreditation um, is is a benchmark for, for lots of different things in terms of quality and that are really quite hard to attain. So any business school with triple accreditation is really in the top tier of business schools in the world. So about only about 100 of them worldwide. And then you can combine that with looking at ranking 
rankings. Um, they're different rankings, weigh different things, but there's famous ones such as Financial Times and QS that CBS does very well in. So I won't do, uh, delve into that too much because obviously you can go away and read that yourselves, but that's just really a starting point if you're early on in this process of looking at an MBA. In terms of us, personal MBA, it's a one-year full-time um, program we're around 40 45 students each year so it's a relatively small program uh, you do really get to know your classmates very well and it's a very diverse cohort from in terms of international in terms of uh, educational background in terms of in terms of industry background as well we're usually over 90 percent international students and the majority of our students do actually stay on in Denmark after the program uh, for very, lots of different reasons it's a very attractive post MBA job market here and the post-study visa is very strong as well, so I think that lends itself to uh, to why so many people stay on the program afterwards. In terms of um, in terms of how the program is structured, like I said, it's a one-year inter- intensive program. But I thought it'd be useful to show you this diagram just to give you an idea of how that year is structured. So. The first three terms are what we consider important for you to to learn from a general management leadership perspective. As I say, it's a general management MBA. So those first three terms are structured in a way that in that first term, we're really helping you understand what internally of the organization is important from a management perspective. The second term, we then move on to looking at the external environment. Uh, so the external factors that are uh, important for you to acknowledge or, or be aware of as a potential manager or a potential leader of an organization. So that's why we are covering things such as economics, marketing, and corporate finance. The third term is about how you bring that together. So how you uh, manage and strategic execution um so things like supply chain uh, innovation and uh, strategy in that term the the final part of the program is where you get to personalize the program so the concentrations are like our electives it's your chance to go deeper dive into a particular uh, topic that you have interest one of those is governance and sustainability and we, and we can talk about that in a bit more detail today um the other uh, part of the final program where you can can personalize the program is the strategy project. And basically, this is like an MBA level internship or consultancy project where you're going into one of our partner companies, about 30, 40 of those approaches each year for a potential MBA level student to go in and do a consultancy project with them. So it can be a go to market strategy, it can be an innovation project. Um, very commonly these days, it's related to sustainability. So again, that's, that's, that's where that's linked in. Um, so that's your chance to sort of personalize the program, the back end of the program. And then throughout the year, you'll be spending time with us on our leadership discovery process, which is really where we're trying to develop you as a more holistic leader in a, in a Scandinavian sense, where here it's um, a very flat hierarchy. So um, how do you how do you lead in that context? How do you lead when you're not necessarily the line manager? So hopefully we'll be giving you throughout the year this toolkit that you can select from in order to apply in different situations, in different um, follower contexts. And so you can negotiate your position as the leader with the respective follower. And then alongside that, you've got a year long module in the careers uh, on, focused on careers, because let's face it, an MBA in Copenhagen is very nice, but you're coming to, to, to an MBA to elevate your career. So from day one, really, we're spending a lot of time with you on a personal level, on a one to one level to make sure that we're getting you towards those career aims. So that's a very brief overview of of the structure of the program, but I just wanted to give you that idea of how how it fits in with this context. And one of the key modules throughout the year, again, is managing sustainable corporations, and I'll I'll come into that in a bit more detail as well. So as I mentioned, um, very focused on careers throughout the throughout the program, and and for those of you who are interested to stay on after the program for for non EU students, there's also what something called an establishment card. This is basically works like the post-study work visa here in Denmark. Um, it's initially granted for two years, um, but you can possibly extend it for another third, uh, an additional year, so a third year, um, which you know translates into very uh, strong post-study work opportunities. And you can sort of see that through our statistics that I'm showing a little bit there of in terms of our employment after six months, in terms of salary increase. I appreciate that's a bit dry, but it gives you an idea of you know people are elevating their career through through this program. You know, 47% increase in your salary you know, that doesn't come through negotiation. Um, and, and if it did, I would like to talk to that person. It tends to uh, to learn how they did it, but it tends it tends to come through 
through a, a step up in, in, in role and, and, and step up in terms of um, the roles that people are doing. And it's very varied what people go on to do after the program. So you can see from in terms of post MBA roles, um, you can see from a really wide breadth there from, from a strategy perspective, business development, product management, sustainability as we're covering today. Um, but I would say those, those particularly these highlighted industries there on that pie chart, that's fairly reflective of each year. So life sciences, finance, consulting, energy and sustainability and tech, I would say consistently each year are probably where our, our most common destinations are. But these days it's so blended where, where these roles lie that, that actually you could be working in consulting, but focused on sustainability. And that's probably something even would, uh, would touch upon as well. Another point uh, in terms of the practicalities that I wanted to, to offer some more insight on, because this usually comes up when we when we have this sort of um, sort of event. From an admissions perspective, we are looking for you to have a minimum of three years post bachelor's full time work experience. We're asking for a minimum uh, of six hundred in your on your GMAT or a minimum of three hundred in a GRE. Um, the class averages are above that, but those are the minimums. Um, we're asking for an IELTS seven or equivalent, just because that's the level of the that we expect you coming in with your English. And we, we actually assess um, applications on an ongoing basis. So whilst we do have these admissions deadlines and admissions round, uh, we have an admissions board every two weeks. So once you've committed um, your application or submitted your application, we're then assessing that within two weeks to offer you to an interview or not. But the final, final deadlines are, are June and July. In terms of the average profile, yeah, I mean, I hesitate to use these sometimes, but it's just it's just to give you an idea because we do have people coming in really diverse, and it's it, these are just the averages, so don't don't read too much into them. But the average work experience is usually around seven years. Average age it varies year on year. It's really to do with people's positioning in the stage of their career rather than their age, and really diverse in terms of education. So you don't need a specific background in say business or finance we have different people coming from different types of backgrounds and if you don't have that finance background for example we do offer a pre-mba uh, to help people prepare um in, in that regard because obviously sometimes that's a bit of a jump uh, for people like me personally when i did my mba that was definitely the biggest jump i had in terms of um in terms of my knowledge but it was also maybe the hardest module so there are there are help for people without accounting and finance uh, backgrounds and then there's the tuition fees on the right hand side there. So approximately 50,000 US dollars, um, 330,000 um, Danish krona. Um, and that, that, that's, um, that's an uh, approximate figure, the 50,000 US. We do have a good number of scholarships, so I'd encourage you if you feel like uh, uh, you're an above average candidate, um, we look at this holistically and we have uh, two sets of scholarships available, relatively straightforward. You apply via your program application, and we're looking for you basically to, to be above average compared to our usual. We get this money to bring talented global talent to Denmark. So basically, we're looking at your academic qualifications, your GMAT, but we're also looking at your work experience, your leadership potential, your international experience, your maturity, your teamwork. So it's really it's really a holistic thing that we're looking at in terms of the, uh, the scholarships. But if you... Um, if you want more information on that, obviously we can share that after, afterwards, but it's relatively straightforward. You apply during your application and we select what potential scholarship um, fund we would take it from. Um, so that's that's a bit more simple perhaps than, than other schools from your perspective. So why Copenhagen? I won't go into this in too much detail because sometimes, um, you know, it's, it's kind of obvious how, uh, you know, Copenhagen, uh, you see, read a lot of things about it being the happiest country and, and that type of thing. And I would say the work-life balance cliche is, is very true. I moved here about two and a half years ago um, and, and it's made it's been a massive difference for us. But I think the main point here as well as I just wanted to sort of highlight to people that Danish is is you don't need Danish before you come. And in fact, we sometimes even recommend to students not start their Danish until they're a few months in because it's intense in the first few months. Um, you know, you've got a lot to work on already, but I would say it's almost one of the best countries in the world in terms of their English proficiency level. I honestly sometimes forget I'm in a non-English speaking country because the English proficiency is so high here. So I would say from an MBA perspective, particularly our students are international, the destinations, their post MBA careers paths are usually in companies where the business language is in English. Um, 
and uh, like the, the, the same with the strategic project, the internship project. Um, so I think that's just something that I would say from that perspective is it, it is almost like an English country in that regard. Very safe place, very good place to do business, but I think it's a, an easy place to land and integrate. And then just to focus really on the topic of the um, of the webinar, in a sense, is the key module. Um, it's uh, well, sustainability in general is a key part of our course and a key part of the culture here in Denmark. Um, the academic dean of our program, his his research area is in sustainability. So naturally, it's it's a it's a real core part of the of the program. The fundamental uh, module is the managing sustainable corporations module. It's a core course within the full time MBA. It's really focusing on not just considering sustainability from a climate perspective. But you know, there's so many aspects that do feed into sustainability, such as labor rights, such as anti corruption, such as uh, diversity and inclusion. So there's, so there's all sorts of aspects of sustainability that sometimes get overlooked alongside of course the climate and energy aspect of it so how do you how do you consider that within a, a business model and how should you consider that as a potential manager coming into a corporation um so you know you're not going to be expected necessarily to be the sustainability technical expert in terms of changing all of the the technical aspects in your organization but as a manager you want to understand that and that applies to many of the aspects of of any mba is that you aren't necessarily going to be the accountant or the uh, the digitalization expert but you want to understand that from a managerial perspective and that's where the the program is pitched in that regard and i, I do think we're, we're unique in that regard because we've been teaching this for for a long long time you then also have the opportunity to to delve into it more deeply um, via the concentration um uh, governance and sustainability and and generally speaking that's that's focused on in terms of esg that's focused on the G of that. It's uh, it's really uh, focused on the governance side of things and circular economy. Um, so you're going into that in a bit more detail on, on that concentration. You don't have to choose that before you join us. You can choose that while you're with us and you have a lot of time to consider that. And then finally, the strategy project. So you can work with one of our partner companies focusing your final project on sustainability. I'd say that's happening more and more. And I just listed some of the the, the, the companies that, that, that did have sustainability orientated projects with us last year. And you can see that they they very and I in purpose put in some varied examples here just to give you an idea of okay there are big scale companies like Capgemini and Austal that approach us for it but there's some more niche level companies in, in very different industries as well that that you should also consider if you're uh, or keep an open mind towards that when you're looking at your strategic project and then in the wider context of being in Denmark, I know it's uh, it's it's known for it internationally, but it really is a world leader in sustainability, um, just from a cultural perspective. But the companies really do walk the talk, so to speak, here. And I think it's a real case study uh, for decarbonization in particular, but I think in sustainability in general, um, in many of their world reaching industries. Um, so I think it's really a it's a great place to get that 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 environment and that culture around sustainability too. So I think that's probably where I'll um, I'll leave my initial introduction there um, because I don't want to go too much into detail because I would like to hear from Ivan. Um, I'll um, probably still control the um, the PowerPoint if that works for you, Ivan, or would you like me to to stop sharing my screen and and you you talk? Well, I trust you, Andy. I think that's that's the best if you just stay in charge of that. Great. Well, you just tell me when you want to move a uh, slide, and then uh, I'll move that for you. Yeah. Well, I think before we go into my presentation, I just wanted to say that I have a great respect for everyone who decides to consider MBA in his life, in his or her life, because it's such a life-changing decision. It, it, it can be. If you do it right, if you approach it right, it can be truly a life-changing decision. And it's a, also a very, very difficult decision if you factor in all the economics and time away from family, from your loved ones, from your country. It's a difficult decision to make, but it can transform your life. And I'm talking about my personal perspective, because for me, it was a very, very long journey before I started the MBA. And I think we can move on. Yeah. So for me, it was like a road for about eight years. Ever since I got my um, master's degree, I was thrilled about the idea of getting an MBA. I thought it's like such a great um, 
thing to do because of the combination of the professional side and, and, and studies and also meeting very, very smart and professional people. And I took indeed a very long time to decide which program to choose and focus on. So a little bit about me. I am a lot of a humanities guy. So I have a degree in social philosophy and MA in international relations. So I'm not this quant guru and I'm not a financial guy. And I did most of my career before in Moscow in two of the big fours where I worked um, in different areas within sustainability consultancy, like starting from non financial reporting and assurance, different types of sustainability strategies, um, a lot of project management experience. And I had a chance to also work and live in three different countries throughout these eight years. And I traveled like over 30 countries, which kind of gave me a good food for thought that what do I want from a study program like an MBA, where I would like to go, it was really, really a big decision for me. And finally, when I um, joined Copenhagen, which was in 2019, um, it was also uh, this year when, as you know, COVID uh, struck the, uh, the global world and I was part of this COVID-19 batch. So my experience was, you know, I got everything and in the end, we also got a digital experience, which was not initially planned, but it was a very nice of it because it also prepared you for the world how it is now. It was maybe not planned originally by the management of the program, but it gave us a good preparation for how the working world occurs now. And following my MBA, um, it's already been two and a half years since I'm working in Denmark. So originally I got a job as a senior assistant manager at a transport company, DSV. And uh, since November, I joined a biopharma company that's called Ascendis Pharma, where I work um, also as a senior sustainability manager, but more in the operational side of it with a supply chain. And yeah, you can see like basically a piece of my old life. Uh, I was a consultant visiting different uh, remote uh, industrial sites, uh, having to wear this uh, interesting uniform of the client and uh, life looks so much different that it, it, it looks right now. So I could not imagine how my life in Copenhagen will be. Um, okay, could you please go to the next slide? But let's try to focus more on the Copenhagen MBA, because I think that's also the topic of discussion today. And um, I'm not a regular uh, presenter at such events. So it's like also a fresh experience for me. So I'm trying to be very genuine with you and explain to you maybe what was behind my decision. So as I told you, it was a very long journey. Almost eight years, I was like picking and choosing different MBA programs. Throughout these eight years, I had two offers from one of the schools in Canada, and then I was offered a place uh, in one of the schools in Germany. I think you know it's ECMT Berlin. But in the end, something was not like checking the box, and I wanted to, to maybe focus more on an MBA that has a stronger component with sustainability. And then I thought, where in the world you could find such a country and such a market where such MBA would be presented. And this is how I came across uh, Copenhagen because it was exactly this program with a strong emphasis on sustainability. Uh, it's Denmark where basically sustainability is like a, one of the competitive driver of the economy. And whenever Danish politicians go abroad to different forums, they always bring a case that how we can even, uh, how we can like lure you into our green economy and how we can attract more investments. And, and Danish companies are really pioneers in many areas of sustainability. And another very important element of that is I worked as a consultant and I didn't like my life in terms of how much time the work took from it. And it left almost no time for hobbies. I think in many other areas, it, it industries, it's the same. So I wanted to work in a country where you have a really, really good work-life balance in a way that it's supported by everyone. Only this way it can work. And Denmark was an absolute sort of like in the middle of this three areas, like mature sustainability markets, um, very good perspectives for um, sustainability professionals and also a country that offered very good work-life balance. I think you all heard, have heard about this life of living, art of living Danishly. What's the book? I don't remember, but it's just described it very well. 
and it's actually true. The book was really uh, almost as Denmark was for me. But so if anyone wants to get a sense of Denmark, uh, uh, scroll the book. It's really, uh, it's really points at, at the right elements of Danish life. And then another important factor I was considering for a potential MBA was like a, a small class. So it has to be very like intimate, very, very nice where you, because one year is not much. So you, you, you better have a chance to, to learn from the people you want to, would like to get to know them properly. And also it has to be an international environment where you like blend with people from all over the world, because in the end, a part of the MBA, it's not just about getting your salary higher. It's not just to get a new job or live in a new country. It's also to meet new people and to learn from them. One year is actually maybe not very, not a very long time, but it's enough to, to get to know your classmates and to learn their perspectives. And we had like the most international group of people you can ever think of. Um, like you can see to the right, to some of my classmates and it's like diversity in a nutshell. Like Kazakhstan, India, Iceland, Brazil, South Africa, Russia. So everyone is presented, and it's really, really like that. And it was like wonderful because with such a small size, you really have enough time and have enough quality time to get to know your classmates and, and create bonds that would last for your life. And maybe another thing that Andy already covered, like in his earlier slides, like, of course ratings and reputation is a big part of it and i obviously also look into the ratings uh, for me it was mainly financial times in a, i would say reputation of cbs like copenhagen business school as a university because it's a very old university was like a, let's say on an equal terms there was very important but at the same time also i took it with a grain of salt because if you look at the ratings they they tend to fluctuate a lot and in the end, it's, it's like if you even get like, you know, in school that is 10, 10 places higher, it is not guaranteed that your, your post MBA career will be better. So it has to be really a wise, wise choice in between location. So you would like to leave. Remember, I, I mentioned that I had two offers from, from Berlin and from Vancouver, but I didn't go there because I realized that my, my prospects would be not as great something was missing and Copenhagen was resonating with me because it, it it connected all the dots i like the city i like the country i wanted to stay there afterwards uh it it, it gave me a good impression as if i could work in english which and he also mentioned it's true it's like you don't even realize that it's so easy and uh, it seems like all, all the danish speakers are also bilinguals it's like very very easy and uh, it just should not be taken for granted for other countries. So just my piece of advice, just consider ratings not as a sole determinator of whether to go or not, because they don't give you enough um, sort of assurance that <laughs> your experience will be great. Yes, and uh, quality is important, and CBS does provide it. And that was my choice. So this, this is our cane. But what was my experience? What given like the shortage of time i would just like try to highlight the main things which were like still makes me uh, wake up and smile in the morning so first of all people because like everybody obviously approach mba from a career perspective which is like perfectly normal because it's like a lot of money and it's a big financial and personal commitment but of course, it's not just about our career prospects. You would like to spend this year with like really, really great people and to make uh, bonds that will hopefully stay for life, which is not very easy when you hit certain age friendships, you know, they're anyway not easy to make. And within such a short time frame, it's even more difficult if you're like in a very, very big class. But at CBS, what I love the most, that our class was so friendly and so helping and so supportive like we were not very competitive in a way that we were trying to you know push each other but rather we were helping and this collaborative environment helped us a lot to study and, and to learn from each other and obviously to to learn from from the program even more and that was even more important because we had to deal with this pandemic which was would be terrible should we not had a support from each other so the, the the class was very very nice and the culture and the environment 
is something that is really, really uh, unique for, for the CBS MBA. And I think this is something that you rarely can find in, in other places. It's, it's, it's really nice. Then if we talk about like the academic aspect, and I, and, and, and I know there was like an announcement about the sustainability and concentration and sustainability as one of the primary topics for today. And I actually chose it. So for me, it was a cho choice between, you know, okay, should I take finance, maybe learn a little bit, or should I take sustainability and learn further? Since I already had a background in sustainability, I thought I would take the second option and I would just deepen my knowledge in sustainability. And I honestly will tell you that it actually was beyond my expectation because I had a, like a, a stronger practitioner lens with me, but I didn't have time to learn theory as much. And uh, Andreas Rasche, uh, he's a, a deputy dean for, um, for who, who is actually teaching sustainability. He's a great uh, professor who, who does like a very big research on different topics with an ESG. And to me, it was very useful because I finally had a time in my career to properly study all these different frameworks within ESG because there is a lot. If you think about it, it's this massive area. It has evolved tremendously and now it encompasses, like Andy said, everything from uh, carbon emissions to, to anti-corruption to, to uh, diverse inclusions. Like it's a massive area and, and you're given a chance to finally properly study it in a structured manner, you, like studying it by, by reading about different companies, how they face it, similar issues and how they tackle them like in their respective way. So it's like a good blend of academic theory, real research, research does matter, and practical cases from companies like, I don't know, Siemens, Airbus, like what they did when they faced the different environmental, social and governance issues. So it was very, very useful because Later on, when you're on the job market, and even though you had already the experience, obviously, that's uh, probably more important, but nevertheless, you need the knowledge. And I just remember that like two weeks after we had one of our classes within governance and sustainability, I had an interview uh, and I was able to actually present a case that was uh, discussed at the class. And that was really something very well received uh, on the employer side. And I just noticed that, okay, that's actually something that I can apply from, from day one. So this is what's very useful, but of course, everything depends on your personal efforts. Like you need to also put your effort into it. It's, it's mutually responsible process and you have to also, of course, um, put your time and invest your time in that. And maybe a third thing that I would like to cover as my you know, personal highlights was this leadership development potential or LDP as we call it. It's a, probably since you have this year for yourself and it's rarely gonna be like that in your life because like you have family jobs, like a lot of different uh, preoccupation and routines which will take away this time from you. But this is a great year and this is a great, uh, channel to learn about yourself through first of all it's a self-discovery because you're given chance and tools to reflect upon yourself like who are you as a person who are you as a person within a working environment whether you're the person within your with your friends who are you as a leader it's a, not a uh, such a straightforward answer there are like different theories within that and finally, you get also 360 degrees perspectives from your classmates and professors. And this involves also some guest lectures, like formal military. This is a really a big part of the program because never ever in my life had a chance to reflect so much about myself. It's, it's really useful because this is a foundation for your future professional platform. If you didn't have one before, or you wanted to basically upgrade it. It gives you right time, right place, right place of mind where you can focus on yourself, study yourself, get to know yourself, get a feedback and take an action if you would like to say, customize it and do something about some of your personal traits and some of your professional features. How to be a better human being. That's basically, that is your chance. But again, it depends of course on your personal commitment and effort so how, how serious you take it so that's why i said a decision to take an mba is extremely important and can be a life changer but for that you need to be also properly mentally prepared 
Um, and I think we don't have that much time. So I think we should also cover a little bit about professional side and since sustainability has been announced as one of the topics. And I was thinking how to approach this dialogue with you. And I thought that since uh, I started with telling you that basically I already had a career in sustainability and I moved to Denmark to pursue another sustainability career. And I chose Denmark because it was a more mature market. And this is exactly what I wanted to like touch upon with you that uh, Denmark is indeed a very, very mature market in sustainability if you, if you decide to choose this as your profession. And for that, you need to also understand where do you stand in this market. So sustainability indeed is very broad and it's very important. So if you ever decide to do that, you have to um, realize where you would like to put your efforts, where to focus. Because I just listed down a, a number of actual jobs, which you will find on LinkedIn. If you like Google, like Denmark, Copenhagen, sustainability, you will find a lot of different jobs so they encompass all these different areas and it's very important to to kind of know where do you have your skill set even though you, if you worked with one of the areas in one areas of sustainability and sustainability it doesn't mean that you have all the skills to to do all the different jobs so if you also would like to use this year at cbs to kind of boost your skills to to upgrade your knowledge it's important to realize where do you stand in this industry early enough and to invest time efforts to learn the skills that you need to to start to do, doing that so it's it's really like a diverse uh playground that has evolved tremendously so that's why called an industry it's obviously not like an industry in a classical way but it's it's definitely has become very diverse so you have a lot of different careers in sustainability reporting risk management strategy uh, which is very different from sustainable finance and this ESG rankings, where basically um, they operate on a similar laws as, as financial markets. Then it's a very different career also if you're an engineer and you would like to work with actually the technical staff, then you can focus on um, designing renewable energy solutions or focus on product life cycle assessments. And you will also find like a separate um, career track then another one is responsible supply chain is how to get hold of suppliers. Then you have social part where you have community engagement, biodiversity, and it goes further, further beyond that. So the point that I would like to address here is if you think that this is something for you and you would like to, to do that, try to map your skills early and try to do it right so be realistic about okay this is what i did if you were an accountant probably have a very good chance of stepping into the sustainable finance if you're an engineer then you definitely have a better prospects of doing renewable energy or uh, life cycle assessment in different engineering fields so important to 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 know where you belong and then cbs can help you to boost in your skills and get the missing knowledge uh, but just try to not to be all over the place, but rather to 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 place yourself correctly, identify yourself with one of the niches and try to invest in this niche. And then you will you'll have a success. Um, we have, I think, about five minutes or six minutes for the questions given time. Um, Yes, Ivan, and I want to yeah. thank you so much for your presentation. I know it has piqued the interest of several of our attendees. And on that note, I would like to uh, come to you with some questions that we have, also, especially for you. So Stephanie is asking, uh, what is the most difficult challenge you have faced in your work so far? And what tool did CBS give you to solve it? I think that the biggest challenge that you also would probably need to pre prepare if you would like to work in Denmark, like in Denmark, consensus is very important. That's why you need to align with internal stakeholders a lot. And if you missed a step in this alignment process, it can backfire you because uh, people uh, would like to be on board it and uh, it can be different in your countries. At least it was in my case. And maybe here in Denmark, you're expected to be very, very autonomous and to drive things on your own and to basically design a new way of doing things if 
if there was pre previously no process. So you have to like be ready to be very, very independent, autonomous, and to give answers for the questions which you might not have yourself. So you have to be very much of a developing your ideas on the go and be ready to, to talk to a lot of people and not to sort of step over them because this kind of consensus driven culture is very important uh, for how business is uh, conducted in Denmark. So on a line, a line, and once again, a line. Thank you so much, Ivan. And I see another question from Irina. She's asking, uh, what do you do in your day-to-day -day job as a sustainability manager? Uh, I missed the first part, I'm afraid. What did I do in where? She's asking, what do you do in your day-to-day -day job mm -hmm. as a sustainability mm -hmm. manager? Okay, so in, in my previous job at DSV, I was mostly a sustainability reporting person. So I was designing how our disclosure will look like, addressing different frameworks like GRI, SASB, uh, deciding how we can disclose different indicators, uh, where to get the data, where to get the content. Right now, my work is more on the operational side and we have to work with our suppliers, understand how to collect CO2 emissions data, understand where do we have our largest environmental and social impact and how to report it to the to different regulators and, and also how to align with people uh, on our supplier uh, side. Very brief. Thank you so much, Thank you so much Ivan. Um, so I know we are in a bit of a tight schedule with time, but we do have one final question for you. Uh, so a participant is asking if mm -hmm. you can um, tell us more about sustainability management in mm -hmm. the biopharma industry. Mm -hmm. So if you can think about mm -hmm. the internal and external factors um, that need to be considered while making sustainability decisions or mm -hmm. let's take initiative. Thank you so much. Well, I have to be honest, I'm uh, myself a newbie to the farm industry, so I probably cannot walk you through the entire depth of it. But uh, as a quick answer, I would say it's a highly regulated industry where sustainability issues are taken also through, through the, the broader, uh, this, it's called good practices, like in pharma. So you cannot just really, for example, plug in a recyclable, a recyclable plastic just because it's a good thing to do. You have to do it also through FDA and it complicates a lot. So it's a highly regulated area, similarly like with other uh, careers in, in, in other like jobs with, within pharma. Uh, sustainability is also very, very regulated. So you have to like, like you have a, like a theme corridor where you can actually do things. So, and um, I think in pharma, it's very important to, to work with your um, suppliers because uh, a lot of this environmental and sustainability impact lies on their, on their shoulders. And it's a very interconnected world. And plus it's important to remember in pharma that patient always comes first and everything has to be taken through the lens of patient. So patient's well-being and how everything a pharma company does it's, and how it is perceived by a patient and how it is uh, in the end uh, affects the patient, like animal testing. So, but regulation, I think that's the most important. It's a very um, different environment and, and the planning cycle. So if you want to do something in five years, you have to do it now, plan it now, because it's like very, very dif different from, from other industries. It's like much slower, but also you need to, to, to anticipate things way in advance. And you cannot just decide uh, one year before the launch of a new drug that you suddenly would like to change one of the parts because you have a more sustainable way of doing that. It doesn't work this way. You have to like submit the entire package. So you must have a very good systematic thinking how change in one area triggers, let's say, um, authorizations in other pr processes. So it's a very um, complex um, industry and very regulated. Thank you so much, Ivan, and thank you so much for your time. I know you need to go now, so I want to thank you once again for being here with us today. We will continue taking your questions. Uh, so to all participants, uh, should you have any further questions, please feel free to tap them in the Q&A box. And Ivan, thank you so much for uh, giving us the time of your day. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for having me and uh, sorry guys, I don't have uh, time to answer all of them. Actually, remember that Andy said something about don't study Danish. So now, now time has come for me to study Danish and I need to run to my course, but I'll be happy to answer to your 
further questions, maybe also outside of this uh, sustainability box, maybe about, you know, like, you know, finance, everything else, because I'm basically probably a good example of this previous slides when I had to the loans and the uh, establishment card. So it's all applicable to my case and I have to do it. So if I can answer your questions, uh, just feel free to shoot them at, uh, and I think Andy will um, pass it on me. And uh, yeah, have fun and uh, good luck with your choice and with your journey. And it was good to talk to you. Bye-bye. Thank you so bye, much, bye. Ivan. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Take bye -bye. care. Speak Thank to you soon. So much. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. So to move the Q&A question um, session forward, I would start by taking the questions that we have gotten in the chat just so they uh, won't get lost. So a participant is asking if they hold a bachelor in law, um, are they suitable to, to start the MBA with CBS? Yeah, we don't have any specific academic background uh, requirements. So it's... it's it's simply a bachelor's degree. Um, so any background is welcome really. And we do get very diverse backgrounds. If you're concerned about, for example, the accounting or finance aspects of things, we also offer this pre-MBA that about, about half of our students take. It's a week long preparation course before the start of the, the proper program. Um, so yeah, we can pretty much welcome anybody from it, from any background. Thank you so much, Andrew. And to stay on that note, a participant is asking if the program is also for Danish people. Definitely, I would say we get, um, ironically this year we haven't, but usually we have uh, Danish people on the course um, and a, a few Scandinavians every every year. Um, although ironically this year, it's 100% international. We had uh, uh, two withdrawals for, uh, because of COVID actually at the last minute uh, this year. Um, so that they're thinking they'll probably join next year. Unfortunately, they got long COVID, which uh, was very unfortunate for them. But yeah, definitely we have um, uh, locals come in on the program each year. Thank you, Andrew. It's a pity to hear about the, the two withdrawals and I hope they are well. Um, yeah. yeah, I spoke to them recently and they're on the mend, but still not quite there. That's a pity. Let's hope they get well soon. So to move forward with the remaining questions, as we do have a lot of them, um, a participant is asking, uh, they are from a developing country, and they are asking if there's any scholarship fee or discount fee uh, that will aid them in bringing uh, ESG sustainability uh, in their uh, uh, home country. Yeah, that's a really interesting question because the scholarships aren't tailored towards or targeted towards specific regions. But um, the scholarship decision making process, we look at the application and in fact, uh, well, the program application and this, the second question we ask you in the program application is, what do you think of business, uh, well, sustainability in a, or, and ESG, CSR, whatever you want to call it, in a business context? Now, what's really interesting is when people from developing countries then can connect it to their local situation. And I would say that's... <clears throat> just generally good advice for us for a strong application in general is when we can see the connection between your your academic rec background your work experience why you want to do the MBA and what you want to do in post MBA what you want to do in the future because there's lots of opportunities within your application and interview to show that so you would just be able to show that through your application and and through your interview because we are getting people from all over the world so there's nothing specific about developing countries in the scholarship application um but it's um it's definitely something people talk to me about when it's either in the interview or within their application so there is scope for you to include that information for sure Thank you so much, Andrew. So I do see a couple more interesting questions. A participant is uh, writing us as an international military applicant. He's asking what is the quota uh, of uh, enrolled military veterans, domestic and international at CBS? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I would say maybe one, one per year. We're a small program. So uh, 40, 45 students each year. So making patterns with this type of thing it, it is relatively tricky when you're that small. But I would say one or two each year, but max, um, who are coming in with post-military, maybe they're supported by exiting the military. That happens in quite a few countries where they get sort of financial support to, and, and uh, let's say government support to reskill. So we've had people come and do that from an MBA perspective, for sure. 
That's great, Andrew. Thank you so much. So a participant is also asking about the prospects of continuing to PhD programs once they are done with the MBA. Yeah, actually, it tends to be the other way around. So we do get PhD students coming into the program because, you know, PhD is very, very, very detailed. It's very technical in the area. And I would say particularly from a life sciences a science in general and, and pharmaceuticals area people are often have a phd um they progress really far into their technical area but then want to switch on to maybe the management or business side of things within the company and actually having that combination of a phd and an mba is tremendously employable and powerful in their context so i'd say it's actually more common the other way around um a PhD is more specific towards uh, a very area, uh, a very detailed area. So an MBA sort of is, is our MBA at least is a general management MBA. We're looking to develop you as a leader. So I don't say it's usually a natural progression for people going on to a PhD afterwards. I would say it's the other way around. We get a handful of PhDs every year, partly because of the um, the strength of the industries in Denmark that are related to life sciences in particular. That's the most common where we get PhDs coming in. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, so uh, a participant is asking if you can speak about the importance of having prior knowledge or experience in a certain con concentration of the MBA before pursuing the MBA. Sorry, one second. <laughs> Sorry. Um, look, I think even described it very well um, and actually that does apply to ourselves as well your post mba goals and your personal and professional goals are obviously important when you're talking to us about an mba and and it's included in the application it's something we interview about having any relevant work experience relevant volunteer experience any sort of connection academically to what you want to do post mba is always going to be helpful um, and it also helps you in, you know, within an application to show that connection and coherent plan that we mentioned in the sense that, OK, we can see why this particular student is coming to us for this MBA. We can see why they want to do that certain thing after the program. So in any, any given topic, any given industry, having that connection is helpful. Um, and I would say having that sort of defined scope, you don't have to have a 100% this is what I want to do with my life plan because that's unrealistic. But having a sort of a, a scope of what your ideas for your post MBA goals is, is, is helpful in that regard. So then you can start to prepare towards that when you come towards the MBA. And it's also helpful for us because then we know which areas we need to help you with. So I would say, yeah, it's not as it's not as black and white as as, as that question makes out, but it's, it is it is helpful. We do have plenty of people coming in and making a switch. Um, uh, either and I think that's the nature of the program full-time MBA you're at least quitting your job to come and do or taking a sabbatical you're changing country maybe you're changing role maybe you're changing industry um, so it does tend to be people coming in doing a transition and at the very least from a country perspective but I would just say it's just naturally aligned from that um, if, if you're looking for targeting something after the MBA the, the more that you can have some insight into that particular industry or that particular role prior probably more industry rather than role it's it's just helpful thank you so much andrew so to move to the next questions um a participant is asking if there's any strategic strategic reason for the program having a one-year duration yeah that's an interesting question um so we have a, a full-time one-year mba and then our executive mba is a part-time um and that's for more senior level managers I think it links to the positioning of the program, basically. It is primarily aimed at international students who are looking to make this, like I say, elevate their career, make this transition to take the next step in their career. Um, and compared to, say, let's say, American schools in particular, having this condensed, yes, it's intensive, you're going to be busy, but having this condensed one year program is actually appealing in the sense that you can do it in a year you can do an internship as part of that you then can progress in your career taking that next step without having to then take a full two years because it's an opportunity cost you've got to weigh up for yourselves as a, as a potential MBA it's to say okay I'm going to be potentially um, out of the workforce here for two years so it's not just the cost of the program it's also the cost of not earning for those two years um, so that's partly why it's 
condensed in, into one year. But yeah, like I say, don't get me wrong, it's intensive, but that's that's the purpose of it. We actually, the part-time program that's spread out a bit further, um, so that's over two years, is the executive MBA, and that's for more senior level managers. So I, I, to, to cut a long story short, I would say it's positioning and the type of people that we can bring onto the program. Thank you so much, Andrew. So a participant is asking um, if, um, do you think the MBA at CBS can equip uh, the participants to blend in a, uh, in a varied sustainability role uh, at top firms in Denmark? So uh, what would you say uh, that the spread of your alumni looks like in terms of career post MBA? So what industri industries are they working in? Yeah, I'd definitely say consulting is the top destination. Now, within consulting, there's lots of different aspects of that. There's lots of different focuses on that. Sustainability is inevitably one of those. Um, talking large scale companies that you'll all have heard of to more niche level companies that probably um, are more focused here on the um, or, or rather are in a Danish context, a smaller company. Uh, but yeah, if I could broadly say cons consulting services are, is is probably our top destination after that. Um, financial services. Um, and I think I, dis I displayed it on this, 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 this pie chart that I showed earlier. Okay, that's from a given year, but I would say it's actually pretty representative of our of our typical um, typical uh, destinations for our cohorts every year. Probably mixing in like uh, legal or NGOs, that type of thing. That that switches each year, I would say. So like education was in there this year, but maybe not everybody goes to education each year. But those those top five industries are pretty are pretty consistent. And in fact, that's why it's so difficult for me to say generally for somebody like that person who might have sent that question, a big part of why we ask you so many questions about your post MBA plans. And in fact, before you even join the program, say if you're admitted, one of the first activities we do with you is like a careers brainstorming, like a careers mapping exercise. So that's when you'd really go into it in more detail with us so we can really define what you're what you're got uh, you're looking for because as 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 Ivan said so brilliantly the program will present you with opportunities throughout the program but it's not it's not like a guaranteed you work you walk into that particular role it's it's a mutual thing so you you're you're having to also we'll present you with all those opportunities but you've got to take them um, so I would say it's it's down to an individual level, and I wouldn't say there's a specific route that I would say, okay, everybody goes to that route, or that's a specific route. But I, I'm sure we we could definitely pick out alumni examples of that particular route. I can definitely think of a few already, but for sure. Thank you so much, Andrew. So uh, we could say for sure networking is a big component of maybe the career that one picks up after the, the MBA. Um, and on that track, one of the questions was actually, how often do students interact with professors and how often do they interact with the alumni network within the program? Yeah, I mean, you're interacting with professors on a daily basis. I would say this Scandinavian style, uh, style of teaching is very interactive, very engaged. You're expected to be participating and it's very team based and, and, that in, and, and you're very much interacting with the lecturer, I would say. For an understanding point of view, it's not just them sat in front of you, you know, talking and you listening and you gaining the knowledge that way. It's more it's more interactive and like, you you know, you do your preparation, you check it with the professor during the class and and work with that in your team and work on case studies there. So I would say there's there's a lot, a lot of prof uh, professorial uh, interaction on that front. On the alumni aspect, I would say this is the biggest difference. For me, I've noticed I was at University of London before, and it's not a criticism. It's just uh, it's just University of London's gigantic, and I would say that's the biggest difference I I noticed is just how interactive the alumni community here is at CBS. It's I think partly because you know you get to know each other so well on the program, um, and and it naturally organically leads to a very uh, engaged alumni community. But in the program itself, yeah, you're at, um, you have these activities throughout i would say every couple of weeks where somebody's coming in to do a talk what we might call a professional breakfast or a workshop of course they're coming representing their companies but chances are most of them are alumni and then more from a prescriptive sense in the leadership discovery process and on the careers module you're assigned an alumni mentor so somebody specifically for you to be connecting with usually it's connected to your area again coming back to those post mba goals which we'll trying to help you with them so yeah, there's a heck of a lot of interaction, particularly on the alumni side of things. 
That's great news, Andrew. Thank you so much. So I just wanted to mention to all participants that want to request their certificate of attendance by Doxity, they can do so by sending an email to um, webinar at doxity.com. And uh, I would like to answer one final question, Andrew. Uh, can we perhaps go back to the admissions criteria and just review, uh, for example, the um, GMAT performance? Uh, I mean, all the criteria that may be uh, required in terms of um, making, making the admission. Um, just so we can offer our participants a final overview of, of what they can expect in terms of applying for the MBA. Yeah, absolutely. I'll jump. I just started sharing my screen again, um, just so you guys can see. That's my contact details. So you're very welcome to to reach out to me directly as well if you have any further questions. Um, this is all of our socials, and we regularly did update those, particularly LinkedIn. So I'd recommend you join uh, join those. But yeah, that's that's my contact details there. If there's any sort of prescriptive questions afterwards or anything, really, you're very welcome to to follow up with a a longer one-to-one -one session let me just find the admissions details here so the, like i say the minimum gmat requirement is 600 and the the minimum requirement is 300 for gre but the average i would say just to give you a general idea is 650 for gmat i think year on year it's there or thereabouts and then the gmat uh, sorry gre would be around 320 so i noticed there's somebody asking about scholarships above average is what we're saying for for that so if you're <laughs> We look at applications holistically. So if you do slightly differently than you'd expected in the GMAT, don't don't necessarily give up because you might be strong in a whole host of other areas. So we don't just look at a GMAT and go, okay, you're in or out. It's very sort of holistic. It's not just one criteria we're looking at. But if you want a general benchmark, I would say minimum 600 in the GMAT and then average is usually 640, 650. Thank you so much, Andrew. So uh, the time for this event has come to an end and I see we still have some questions, but I have taken note and Andrew, if you, if you would like, I can forward this to you and hopefully the people who have asked them will also reach out to you. So to all the participants that have stuck with us till the end, do not worry, you will get the recording of the event. And for those of you who join us later, uh, you will be able to review all the information that has been presented today. So keep an eye out on your inbox uh, and, of course, also in the spam folder and in, ca in case it lands there. Uh, and I just wanted to thank all of you so much for being here with us today and for joining us for this event. Uh, the affluence has been great. So uh, I hope that Andrew had a great time and also thank yeah. you so much for, um, for taking the time out of your day to answer all the questions. And no, once thank, again, uh, thank you also to sure. Ivan. Yeah, thank you for bearing with me when I was uh, starting to lose my voice as well. So that was really good. And thank you, guys. Uh, really good questions. And you've got our contact details and, and we'll follow up as well. So, yeah, really, really happy to help. And Ivan was great. So I'll have to buy him a bottle of wine to say thank you afterwards. <laughs> but, yeah, thank okay, you so good. much. Yeah. Thank you once again so much. And I hope everyone will be safe. So uh, once again, thank you and have a nice day or evening according to where you are connecting from. And I hope to see you hopefully again for the next event in partnership with CBS. Thank you so much and see you next time. Bye-bye.